She is an expert in women's issues and a senior advisor to Urban Swirsky and Associates, as well as Right Now Women. She previously served in the State Department as the Director of the Office for International Women's Issues. Staying with our theme of axes and alliances, Andy is going to talk about many of the alliances among women around the world and the way they create uh, positive change in different areas. Casey Pfeiffer is director, we're, we're hopping up and back. Casey Pfeiffer is the director of the Institute of Institute Relations at Atlas Network, which serves as the center of gravity for a worldwide effort to create freedom and opportunity. She's going to talk about the network of intellectual entrepreneurs, um, which I have not heard of before, and I'm really looking forward to that, who at times against great adversity work toward a shared vision of a free, prosperous, and peaceful world where limited governments defend rule of law, private property, and free markets. Uh, Dr. Suzanne Schulte, who is going to be our last speaker, is president of the Defense Forum Foundation, which promotes a strong national defense um, and freedom, democracy, and human rights abroad. She also serves as chairman of the North Korea Freedom Coalition, vice co-chair of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, and honorary chairman of Free North Korea Radio. As you can imagine, she will talk to us about North Korea, and specifically a fascinating network of North Korean women who created a vibrant and functioning free market system through their sheer determination to feed their families. So we'll go, Andy, okay. first. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Shoshana, and it's a pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists and all of you here tonight, an honor to be here at the Council on Foreign Relations, and especially speaking to an audience uh, put together by the Independent Women's Forum, one of the most effective and wonderful organizations in Washington, D.C. today. Um, as we know, the topic of our conference is tyrants, terrorists, and threats to the 21st century world order. It's a fascinating topic, and unfortunately, though, as the years go by, the threats don't seem to d diminish. But we're here tonight to talk a little bit about some of the good news. And I was asked to discuss the importance of alliances, especially how they can empower women around the world and push back on threats that come up to democracy. I think many of us know how important strategic alliances are and how networks can make a real impact. Most people want the chance to know those with similar interests. They want to identify greater opportunities for learning, perhaps achieve an elevated social profile, and enjoy the comfort that comes from knowing there is strength in numbers. Women especially are known to be adept networkers in our social lives, family lives, and professional endeavors as well. When we look at the power of alliances between women around the world, it is amazing to see how cultures can be shared and progress can be made in so many different ways. When women are respected members of society, we see a shift toward greater democracy and even-handedness. When I was the director of the International Women's Issues Office at the Department of State, we were always looking for ways to highlight advances made by women. We wanted to celebrate women from around the world and raise awareness about their impressive work. It was huge to recognize the power of public praise and support. So thinking about it, we thought what better way to do that than to create an award, an award bestowed um, in partnership by the United States. So we came up with the Secretary of State's International Women of Courage Award. This award annually recognizes women around the globe who have demonstrated exceptional courage and leadership in advocating for peace, justice, human rights, gender equality, and women's empowerment, often at very great personal risk. We had our team at the U.S. Embassy in country select a woman to be honored. We made sure our ambassador would approve the selection, taking into consideration the work that she was doing and how this particular woman would reflect positively on U.S. interests and what kind of impact our country's support would have on her work. Since the inception of the award in 2007, the State Department has honored over 100 women from more than 60 different countries. As the nominees are sent in from U.S. embassies around the world, there were a certain few chosen every year to be the International Women of Courage for that particular year. 
we would bring the women awardees to Washington. They would be honored by the secretary, sometimes the president, uh, first lady, and other governmental representatives. We knew for that first year that being honored by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, that would give them international attention and hugely important, a platform from which to speak. When we wanted to highlight a certain issue, we would look for our women of courage around the world and make sure to travel to their country, talk about their issues, drawing attention to their works and to their colleagues. A network was created that day in 2007, and it still very much exists today. These women of courage are able to interact with each other, and the United States has created valuable relationships with each of them. I'd also like to turn and highlight the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. This effort began after the attacks of September 11th and was a way for Mrs. Laura Bush to express our country's support for the women and girls in Afghanistan during that time of war. The U.S. Afghan Women's Council is a nonpartisan public-private partnership that convenes governments, civil society, and the private sector around the goal of supporting Afghan women and girls' education, health care, economic empowerment, and leadership. It was founded in 2002, and today it lives at Georgetown University. It's co-chaired by the president of Georgetown University and our U.S. ambassador at large for global women's issues. They serve alongside the Afghan Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Afghan Minister for Women's Affairs. All members of the council are expected to initiate a project that will benefit the women and girls of Afghanistan and address critical areas of need as identified by the Afghan leaders on the council. Over the years, the council has added new members and created entrepreneurship and business training programs. Graduates of these programs train other aspiring businesswomen, and the network continues to flourish and grow. There have been many successes brought on by the council, like expanding educational opportunities, improving health care, and truly molding the women leaders of tomorrow. One member said the success felt like this, quote, Initially, it felt like digging at a mountain with a spoon. Then the spoon became a shovel, and the shovel became a bulldozer, end quote. The council provides support, camaraderie, opportunities to share ideas. It's a strong and vibrant example of women from two very different countries working in partnership. Another powerful network I'd like to highlight uh, that has made a measurable impact on women's health and started here in the United States but has now since branched out to the international community is the Susan G. Komen organization. I think many of us know the Komen organization works to save lives by meeting the most critical needs in our communities and investing in breakthrough research to prevent and cure breast cancer. Their goal is to reduce the number of breast cancer deaths in the United States by 50% by the year 2026. I would venture to say that everyone in the United States has seen a pink ribbon, bought a product perhaps with a pink ribbon on it, and is somewhat familiar with the fight against breast cancer. As a matter of fact, today is October 3rd. We're in Breast Cancer Awareness Month. October has been designated as such. The Komen example, or the Komen organization I wanted to bring up because it's an example of a huge national network that has spread from Texas to now all states in our country, and really here in the United States has changed the way we discuss breast cancer, treat breast cancer, and support survivors in the U.S. It was started by one woman, Ambassador Nancy Brinker, who promised her sister, who then later died of the disease, that she would find a way to make an impact in the fight. This one woman worked with friends and neighbors and person by person created this movement, this alliance, and this network. I bring it up because back um, at my time at the State Department, they were right on the brink of starting to take this work in the United States with Komen internationally. And it branched out over the years to the international community. Today, they partner with local government and non-governmental organizations in communities worldwide to implement innovative programs aimed at increasing awareness, education, screening, and access to quality care. 
To date, Komen has awarded more than $18 million in community health grants outside of the U.S. They're doing work in Italy, Germany, Puerto Rico, the Middle East, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. It's an example of the best of American innovation going outside into the global community and working with others to fight against this disease. I had the privilege of actually meeting a woman, Dr. Samia al Almudi. She's a physician and a breast cancer survivor who actually diagnosed herself. And she's based in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. She wrote a book while she was in Saudi Arabia called Breast Cancer Break the Silence. And the writing shows the difficulty in discussing the most intimate parts of a woman's body in a culture that very often today still demands silence around such issues as these. Dr. Ala Moody became a pioneer in her country for continuing to speak out about breast cancer and urging attention in Saudi Arabia to this issue. She turned her diagnosis into a broader campaign for women's health that sought to break down the cultural barriers in the name of women's health. As a matter of fact, she was one of the first International Women of Courage who was awarded in 2007. And it was interesting. I spent quite a bit of time with her um, in Saudi Arabia and here in Washington. And I was struck by how fortunate we are in the United States to have the openness and the awareness that we enjoy around women's health issues. Here we are celebrating Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We look at pink products in every store, and yet there are many, many in the world today who would feel great shame if they were diagnosed, blame themselves, and regardless if they were, they would never speak of what they're going through. It can be sometimes very startling to recognize that your perspective can be so vastly different when compared to others. On that point, I'll tell just one other personal story. I remind myself in, of an exchange I had with an African ambassador a few years back. There were a group of, of um, African American women ambassadors. We were discussing uh, access to education and how education can be improved, especially for girls in, in various countries. Um, the conversation had been going on for a while. And we were talking about access and, you know, how can you implement testing and, you know, change curriculum. And she stopped us and she said her problem is not what the girls are learning in school, but rather that the girls in her country fear going to school. And it kind of stunned the table. You know, everybody stopped and she said, you know, it's, it's not common for girls to attend school regularly because they fear being kidnapped or being raped on the way. And additionally, many parents would not value education, wouldn't want to take them away from their household duties, um, and don't think that education is something they should be spending their time on. And she, she pulled me aside privately, and she said it was very difficult listening to the conversation because she felt like she just couldn't relate to the problems that were being raised by her fellow colleagues, her fellow ambassadors. And that conversation has struck with, stuck with me over the years because it made me truly realize how recognizing other perspectives, finding common ground in pursuit of these shared interests contributes so much to the strengthening of societies that ultimately will benefit women and men. So I'm going to kind of wrap up here mentioning two women-centered organizations that are very much doing work right now, building civil society and in training women leaders. One such organization, it's affiliated with the International Republican Institute. It's called the Women's Democracy Network. Founded in 2006, the WDN is committed to fostering women's leadership and helping to grow democracies that represent all citizens, regardless of gender. Right now, it's active in more than 60 countries and has trained thousands of women on how to become leaders and has linked them with their peers in countries that, that share similar struggles. They empower participants to communicate, negotiate, and run successful political advocacy and local issue campaigns, all while helping break down cultural, economic, and systemic barriers. Another important organization is Vital Voices. 
In 1997, Vital Voices was created to make space for women to be heard. The founders knew then what has now become a universal truth. Women are essential to progress in their communities. Our world truly can't move forward without their full participation. Vital Voices invests in leaders because they take on the responsibility to improve societies. They strengthen laws, create jobs, and defend political freedoms. Each leader in their global network believes in mentoring the rising generation and shares her knowledge, experience, and influence with others. The women involved in Vital Voices are activists, innovators, and entrepreneurs, and they come from cities and villages and from every educational, religious, and socioeconomic background imaginable. All of these efforts and organizations are examples of women advancing in every aspect of different societies. Some change comes more slowly in certain countries, but there is a sense of solidarity among many women and a shared hope that progress will continue. The threats and the dangers that continually arise in our modern day global community can no doubt be beaten back by the continued and supported empowerment of women standing together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Casey. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shoshana um, and Claudia, for having me here today. Um, like Shoshana said, I'm very excited to be inspiring you guys to be hopeful. That is my personal mission after some of, you know, maybe more disheartening talks <laughs> earlier today. Um, so first, I kind of want to get you guys involved here. So what comes to mind when you hear these three countries, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Uganda? Just call out some words. What do you think of? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a mess, right? Uh, you know, war, violence, poverty, right? These are some pretty typical responses. But my response uh, when I hear these hear of these countries is a little different, a little bit more hopeful. Um, so if you ask me, I would say that when I hear Afghanistan, I think of Khalid Ramizi. Um, this is a young man. He's based in Kabul. He runs a radio station that has a thousand daily listeners. And on that radio station, he talks about cultural tolerance and the virtues of a free society. In Ukraine, I think of Natalia Melnik. Um, she is just one part of a tremendous effort uh, to free up business and decrease corruption in Ukraine, a place that was literally burning three years ago. In Uganda, I think of Mugabe Socrates who is so restlessly teaching East Africans about the virtues of freedom and sharing updates on Facebook about his work that it took me nearly 10 minutes of scrolling through his Facebook a couple nights ago to find this photo. Now, this isn't all to downplay the very serious issues these countries are facing. Indeed, while Khalid focuses his energy on spreading uh, the message of freedom and cultural tolerance across Afghanistan, his home base of Kabul is a regular and frequent terrorist attack target. In Uganda, Mugabe and his colleagues face real threats to security when speaking out against government oppression. But isn't it encouraging to know that in places like these, there remain a few stoic individuals who choose to spend their time and energy not just on survival, because that's what most people are doing in these places, but also on planting the seeds of freedom to sow a better future for their communities. At Atlas Network, we call these extraordinary people and their colleagues intellectual entrepreneurs. Atlas Network is an organization that serves as the center of gravity for a worldwide effort to create freedom and opportunity where too often there is instead oppression and poverty. We help local organizations in more than 90 countries, and these organizations are developing and implementing solutions to unfair situations where everyday people are being denied the opportunity to improve their lives. Most of these organizations are what we would call think tanks. This means they're agitating for changes in public policy. And lucky for us, there are nearly 500 of them across the globe. During my time here with you today, I will argue three things. One, this network is growing. Two, this network is winning. And three, the best is yet to come, and you should be hopeful for the future. First, this network is growing. 
Atlas Network currently has more than 490 official partner organizations based in 94 countries. So to give you an idea of the kind of organization that qualifies for partnership with Atlas, they must operate independently. They can't get government funding. Um, they have to meet a minimum budget requirement, so they have to have kind of this full-time operation. They have to have a professional online presence, and of course, they must be working toward our shared vision of a free, prosperous, and peaceful world, where the limited governments of their countries defend the rule of law, private property, and free markets. When looking at a cross-section of all of these organizations, more than half were founded in the year 2000 or later. In the last two years alone, we have added 98 new partners to our official partner lists. Those organizations are based in 23 different countries, and those countries include Myanmar, Nigeria, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and Burundi. One of our most inspiring intellectual entrepreneurs and new partners is, comes from Amab Munirakiza. A few years ago, Amab came to Atlas Network with a simple request. Could we send him books about the principles of liberty, but in French? so that he could spread the ideas of liberty across Francophone Africa. Since then, he has done tremendous work with students in Burundi, Rwanda, and the Congo, hosting events and teaching students about what it means to live in a free society. This year, he officially launched a think tank, the Center for Development Enterprises Great Lakes. He has been able to raise, with his team, an astounding 8,000 US dollars from a local and some international individuals. That is 26 times the GDP per capita in Burundi. So think about that for a second. Not only that, but his think tank is already impacting policy. Their work recently convinced the Ministry of Commerce to reduce the fee for registering a business from 78 US dollars to 22. Imagine the impact this will have in a country where average yearly income barely reaches $300. Second, this network is creating wins for freedom. Throughout its existence, Atlas Network has nurtured a network of civil society organizations that believe in the principles of free enterprise, rule of law, and individual rights. Often, they focus on broad-based ed educational efforts. So one partner in Morocco has translated John Locke, Adam Smith, many others into Arabic because they realize that if Karl Marx is the only European philosopher available in the local language, that's a pretty dangerous thing for the country and that's a pretty dangerous thing for the broader Arab region. This is important work, and it's brave work that takes on the challenge of reconciling Islamic traditions with enlightenment ideas of individual liberty and cultural tolerance. Increasingly, however, our partners are doing more than just spread the ideas in this general, general way. Three years ago, Atlas Network began challenging our partners to call their shots with regard to specific reforms. We said, hey, what policy reform could you achieve in your country that would boost its score on the Economic Freedom of the World Report? And then we funded the projects. Here were some results. Let's just talk about the first of these. So there was a law in India establishing minimum capital requirements to start a new business. What this means is that it was not up to the entrepreneur or his investors, or her investors, I should say, uh, to open the doors to their business. They first had to get approval from a government bureaucrat that said, yes, you have enough rupees in your bank account to start a business. And that limit was actually almost equal to the per capita income in India. For many small entrepreneurs, this wasn't a barrier to entrepreneurship. This was a complete dead end. But thanks to our partner, the Center for Civil Society, which did the research to show the human costs and the marketing to energize the public about the problem, India's government abolished the minimum capital requirement. Now, vendors like these live in a freer India where they can pursue their dreams. Not listed on this slide is our most recent partner policy win. Last week, the Sri Lanka-based Advocata Institute successfully reduced the nationwide tax on female sanitary napkins by 40%. Before this change, the tax was as high as 102% of the product price. As American women, Access to products like these, this isn't something that we even need to think about, but the reality is much different for women in poor countries like Sri Lanka. This tax reduction is a win for public health and it is a win for human dignity. And it's all because freedom fighters in Sri Lanka launched a think tank with the help of Atlas Network only three short years ago. Finally, the best is yet to come. 
If I haven't already convinced you that the future of the global freedom movement is bright, I'll give it one more plug. You might wonder about Atlas Network's role in all of this and why we're so optimistic. Our goal is twofold. First, raise our partners' capabilities and raise their ambitions. And second, stay deferential to their vision about what makes the most sense on the ground. We describe our model as coach, compete, and celebrate. We coach our partners through world-class training. They compete for, with one another for grants and awards. And finally, we celebrate their work by featuring it in events, promotional material, and case studies that allow organizations to learn from one another. It would be really easy for our partners to be self-satisfied, knowing they're working hard for a good cause. We've seen more and more that it's only by interacting with peers and learning that they're behind in certain ways that they discover the many ways that they can up their game. Atlas is where these powerful network effects happen so that groups get better and better year after year. And we've seen that, whether it's from the quality of the impact in our Templeton Freedom Award finalists or the performance from our grantees. Another reason for hope? The list of wins I mentioned earlier were part of a group of 10 policy victories that came from a set of 29 projects worldwide in 2015 and 2016. The others achieved some media mentions, some other recognition, but they didn't hit their big goal. We invested a little less than $2 million in these 29 projects, including those that haven't yet had a, had a win. So if we do some math, that's less than $200,000 per win. And these are wins that have long-lasting effects on institutions and communities. Now compare that with the cost of big aid, which pours billions and billions of dollars into difficult countries each year for short-term relief that does nothing to improve the institutions that empower people long-term. That reality has lit a fire under our efforts, and we are scaling up for that reason. With new support, we are targeting, targeting 40 similar projects in the next 12 months as part of our Doing Development Differently campaign. And now, let me give you one more example of our partner's work that I think is especially meaningful. I have a video, so let me... Black South Africans have been denied property rights since a 1913 law took land and houses owned by black people and banned them from owning property, leaving them completely reliant on apartheid socialist housing. Today, between five and seven million black families live in these apartheid-era houses, and although 1991 legislation gave them ownership rights, Government inaction on titling means they still live in constant fear of losing their homes. Kaya Lam means my home and aims to correct this injustice by helping black South Africans secure fully tradable titles to their property. The Kaya Lam pilot project in the Nguati area has given hundreds of fully tradable title deeds to homeowners and unlocked $4.5 million of previously dead capital for this impoverished community and it has created a blueprint for the titling of all such properties in South Africa. With the Kaya Lam project, the Free Market Foundation is reversing one of the greatest crimes of apartheid, promoting respect for property rights and laying the foundation for a free and prosperous future for all South Africans. Um, so here is one of the beneficiaries of this project, Maria Muthupi, and she is from South Africa, and this is a picture of her celebrating her 100th birthday. And for the first time, she's celebrating that birthday in her own home. As the video explained, the Free Market Foundation, a partner of Atlas Network, helps people like Maria navigate the process to get title to their property. With property title also comes the incentive to improve the property itself, use that opportunity to, for capital for loans, for education, or a new enterprise. Now, when considering this story, you might think, isn't this a case of a too little too late? At age 100, is Maria going to go back to school or start a business? Well, probably not, right? But listen to what she had to say at the ceremony where she got the title to her land. She said, I can sleep well now. I have an asset to pass to my children. This reminds us the value of reforms like this can't all be measured in economic models. I mentioned at the start of my talk that I spent a good deal of time scrolling through Mugabe's Facebook a couple of nights ago. 
As I scrolled past the many photos of his work in Uganda, I was struck by a comment beneath one of his posts. It read, liberty is humanity. That is why the work that we do at Atlas Network is so full of meaning. Liberty is humanity. Atlas has a smart strategy to assist local efforts in bringing opportunity, prosperity, freedom, dignity, and humanity to people all over the world. And it is changing hearts and minds, even in Uganda. Thank you. Well, I'm very humbled to be with these ladies. They're doing amazing work, uh, and it's a great honor to have been invited by Claudia. I was being an upstart at a lunch, and she's like, you know, you should come to our panel. So that's why I'm here. Um, I, uh, I'm really honored to be here. I, I, I know I'm the last speaker, and I appreciate all of you hanging tough to the, to the end. <laughs> uh, but I do think I, I've got one of the best topics, because I'm really going to underscore exactly what you just heard about the, uh, about, well, the importance of promoting uh, American ideals. I dismiss completely some of the, what, the, the discussion a little bit earlier because I absolutely do believe we do need to promote the ideals of our country uh, and what we stand for because they're universal I ideals. Um, so as the last speaker, I'm going to tell you about a truly remarkable uh, example of the human spirit and how the women of North Korea have changed North Korea internally forever by creating a free market system. To begin, I don't want to give the impression that uh, North Korean women have any kinds of, of rights. Uh, North Koreans are and remain, I believe, the most persecuted suffering people on earth. Uh, that was uh, also affirmed by the UN Commission of Inquiry's findings in February 2014. And North Korean women bear the brunt of the human rights violations. They're subjected to gross violations of human rights every day, and they do not even understand the concept of rights. The optics we get out of North Korea are truly disturbing. We see the massive crowds of uh, North Koreans that were crying with great emotion when Kim Jong-il died, um, a mass murderer who, kill, who killed three million of them at least. Uh, we see the goose-stepping soldiers on parade. We just saw the mass games recently. And, um, but I want you to see a part of North Korea that doesn't get talked about and doesn't get reported. First of all, a few facts, uh, facts about North Korea that set it apart from any nation um, in, in the world. It's the only country in the world that does not enjoy a single human right under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A tragic irony that that document was passed in 1948, which was when Kim Il-sung came to power. It's the only country in the world without a single human right. Uh, it's um, also the only country in the world where children can be sent to a political prison camp and children can be born in political prison camps and spend their entire lives there. Um, it's a country where the regime works to isolate the population, and they start brainwashing people at a very young age, especially to hate Americans. Um, it has a Sungbun classification system, which is similar to the um, apartheid system, which ranks all citizens. I know China's getting ready to establish one of these, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a classification system which ranks all citizens based on three major categories, loyal, wavering, or hostile, and there's over 50 subcategories. Um, it had a public distribution system where everything was distributed from the regime based on loyalty of that Sungbun classification system. Uh, but North Korea is the clearest example before us, I believe, of the difference between a democratic state and a totalitarian state and what that means for the people. As these, the Koreans, uh, Koreans are the same people, but those living north of the DMZ have completely different living standards and life expectancy, et cetera, than those born south of the DMZ. Another unique aspect of North Korea it is, is that it is the only country in modern history to have seen massive starvation in the absence of war. That's never happened before in modern history. At least three million people died because of the famine, which started in the mid-1990s. But this is the period that led to the women of North Korea, out of sheer desperation to feed their children, their husbands, and their parents, to create a free market system. This free market system is vibrant and functioning today, and it is the reason why you do not see the level of starvation and deprivation in the past. It's not because Kim Jong-un is better at feeding his people than his father or grandfather. It's because of the women of North Korea. Because the regime controlled access to food and material goods through the public distribution system, where you were rewarded through the Sungbung, the entire, entire country was dependent on the Kim regime for survival. For example, if you were high up on Sungbung, you may have access to corn and uh, other and rice. If you're middle, you may have middle level, you may have only had access to just corn and 
the wavering, you might not have access to very much at all. Um, this applied to material goods from Mercedes Benz, which the only elites would have access to, to refrigerators. Uh, this is how the whole system was, the whole country was dependent on, on, on the, um, the whole, all the people were dependent on the regime. But this system completely broke down in the 1990s, which triggered the massive starvation. And it was the resiliency of the North Korean women that led to them to start trading and selling among themselves. And this l led to an explosion of private markets throughout North Korea to such an extent that the majority of the population now survives on these markets. It was through their own determination that North Korean women saved the people in their country from starvation because they became capitalists and free marketers. And I want to quote in the words of one North Korean woman, Miss Chu, although all the factories were closed due to a lack of energy, people, especially men, still had to go to work every morning or they would be punished for being anti-communist because North Korea is a highly patriarchal patriarchal system and male-dominated society, it is not culturally allowed for men to sell in the market. So women became the breadwinners of the family. Ju said that when you went to a market, you 95% of the vendors there were women. They're selling clothes, household items, rice, vegetables, and other condiments. Quoting from her, she said, at 19 years old, she started to sell rice in the market. From early morning to late night, we brought rice, flour and corn from Chinese traders, sold them in the market, and with the money earned, bought enough food and firewood for the day. We basically lived hand to mouth. So even if we were sick, we had to go to work. The life of North Korean women is nothing but struggle every day. But I know so many North Korean women that came up with so many different ways to make money, whether it was selling fish, whether it was making rice cakes, whether it was uh, getting firewood, going to the market and selling the firewood. This is where, how the markets began to spread. And the regime tried repeatedly to control these markets. First, it tried to limit the um, any women, only women 35 um, and older could use the markets. That didn't work because the women pushed back. Only women 25 or older could use the markets. That didn't work. They kept trying to control the markets. And finally, they, they uh, decided to do a currency devaluation. This was widely reported in the news. 2009, they tried to reassert control over the private markets by reissuing a new currency in North Korea. The purpose of this actually was to attempt to reassert control over the over this growing economy, but it completely failed. The overwhelming hostile reaction to the currency devaluation by the North Korean people led the regime to do something that has never been done in the entire history of North Korea. The regime actually apologized, and it backed, backed away, and it blamed this uh, poor guy named Pak Dam Gi. They blamed him for the currency devaluation, of course, it, it's North Korea, they executed him. But this is an amazing turn of events that happened. North Korean women pushed back against the regime. The regime not only apologized, but it officially acknowledged their own failure. Now, I know that Kim Jong-un was actually behind that currency devaluation, but Park gun got the blame for it. Now the regime has completely accepted the existence of these markets, and the elites are doing what they can to also benefit from them. A CSI, CSIS study that came out recently said that there are at least 436 officially sanctioned markets now located across the country. There's an average of 48 markets located in each of the nine provinces. This study also found that 72% of respondents in a survey that they did received almost all their household income from markets, 72%. Additionally, 83% of respondents found outside goods and information to be of greater impact on their lives than decisions by the North Korean government. So given such significance of market trading and bartering activities, it's not surprising that anger over government predation of market activities and individual entrepreneurial efforts to better their lives was very prevalent. So basically, that not only have they created these markets, but they pushed back against, against the regime and relied more on each other than on the Kim regime. Now, the Free North Korea Radio, which you mentioned, I'm the honorary chair of that, they're broadcasting the North Korea every day. It's the most popular single broad program broadcasting North Korea, I might add. Uh, Free North Korea reports now that there's over, or I'm sorry, close to 5,000 markets in North Korea including micro-sized local grasshopper markets, which I think would be kind of like a farmer's market that they move, they, they're basically hop around. Um, but it's the women of North Korea who did this. The famine not only led to these private markets, but also led to the people no longer trusting the regime. When you talk to defectors now, they tell us that in the past, it was everybody's desire to become a member of the Korean Workers' Party, because that would move you up on the Sungbun classification system. But now their goal is to make money 
and to support their families. And this is a huge change in the thinking of people in North Korea. Women are also, I want to point out, um, are the ones who educated us about North Korea. I mentioned the UN Commission of Inquiry report. Who are most of the people who have escaped from North Korea are women. It's their testimonies that have given us all this evidence to conclude about the crimes against humanity that are occurring in North Korea. They're also involved in the rescue movement. I know one North Korean woman who's rescued 7,000 men, women, and children. I, I call her, her the Harriet Tubman of, of North Korea. But women are also very much involved in the information campaign, everything from radio broadcasting to balloon launches to rice bottle launches. They're very much involved in trying to get information back into North Korea. So what are the things that we should be doing in response to all this? First of all, we should, be, we should be pressuring China on the refugees that are escaping out of North Korea. Not many people know about this, but you know, you have uh, China with a one-child policy, there's a shortage of women in China. And you have North Korea where the women are the ones trying to feed their families. There's a horrific trafficking situation that's been going on for decades. There are, slave, there are markets where women are sold. And this is something that not many people are paying attention to. We've got to pressure China on what they're doing to these refugees, because re the, China will not allow these refugees safe passage to South Korea, where they have automatic citizenship, but instead hunts them down and forces them back to North Korea, knowing that they will be imprisoned and tortured, and in some cases executed. Second thing we need to do is we need to do more to increase the flow of information in North Korea. This is something I'm very passionate about. I've been involved in balloon launches. I've been involved in rice bottle launches. We do this radio broadcast in North Korea every day. I'm a big believer that the truth will set them free. That's um, really important to get information into North Korea. Um, and we also, when we send in the balloon launches, we send in U.S. $1 bills, which are real popular in the North Korea markets. We call it the economic stimulus package. Also shortwave <laughs> radios, pamphlets, just information about the truth. Um, the other thing is very important, it's kind of touchy right now, human rights. We have to talk about human rights. Human rights should be the number one issue in addressing North Korea. We have to stop making it secondary because it's a fact. All the countries that are a threat to peace, all the countries that are a threat with weapons of mass destruction have one thing in common. They're a threat to their own people. And we're, I believe that we have got to emphasize these, the, the issue of human rights and it's something that we should be doing. Do I have time to tell a story? Yes. I do. Okay. I'm going to close with just one quick story. Um, this, there's a, uh, just, this is one example of the kind of people that I've gotten to know in my work on North Korea. A woman named Kim Oak Gum. Kim Oak Gum has come to represent to me the hope of the people of, of North Korea. I hosted her in Washington, D.C. and at the U.N. for, uh, for an event about, uh, about the human rights situation there. Like so many people during the famine, her family was starving. She had a 10-year-old son and a husband. She left North Korea to go to China to try to, um, to get a job, to try to get food to, f to feed her family. Unfortunately, she was arrested in China. And since China refuses to honor its international treaty, obligations and forces North Korean refugees, refugees back to North Korea. Uh, she was forced back to North Korea and sent to a political prison camp. And I, I remember this like it was this morning. On a train, Amtrak, Amtrak train from Washington, D.C. to New York, I remember her describing to me how she felt so fortunate that she was sent to a political prison camp that was a farm, a working farm, and that she, that way she had access to plants and bugs. And so she felt fortunate. She was in a political prison camp where she got to work outside and describing to me how she forced herself to eat grasshoppers because she knew grasshoppers were full of protein. She was so determined to be able to survive being in this political prison camp to be reunited with her husband, 10-year-old son. She survived that, uh, that camp, that detention camp that she was in. She was released. She went home to her hometown. Her husband had divorced her because he didn't want to be married to a woman that had been in a political prison camp. Her 10-year-old son had died of starvation. She had no reason to stay in North Korea. So she fled again and went uh, to China. She got arrested again. She's in a detention center in China facing repatriation. There's another woman in that detention center who's crying uncontrollably. And Kim Oak Gum said, what's wrong? She said, I, I left my daughter behind. I left my daughter. I'm so worried about my daughter. Kim Oak Gum helped that other woman escape. And as a result, Kim Oak Gum was brutally beaten almost to the point that she became paralyzed. Fortunately, in a Korean American, pastor working in China heard about the story and raised enough bribe money to get Kim Oak Gum, uh, uh, bribed him to get her released or uh, bri bribed the Chinese to release her. And she was eventually able to resettle in South Korea. She lives in Busan now. But the reason why I tell you that story 
is that I happen to be a Christian, so my work is motivated by my belief in the value of every human being. Kim Il Gum was raised to hate Americans, <laughs> to, to believe and to be a slave to that dictatorship. And yet, she never lost her humanity or human spirit. She put her own life in danger to rescue another person. She represents to me the, uh, the true spirit of the, of the North Korean people. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I'm happy to answer any questions. We have about two questions worth of time. I think that was a great story to end on. Um, so I'm glad you used up a few extra minutes. We have a question here and a question here, and we'll call it a day. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, I, I'm friends with um, Dr. Phyllis Chesler, who, as you all may know, is, um, was one of the founders of the feminist movement here decades ago, and is one of the only people I know who speaks out about women's rights on an international stage, um, and in particular, the rights of the human rights of Muslim women. Um, how do you activate the American feminists? Because I firmly believe that if Amer the American feminist movement could be activated, you would you would see a, a change on the world stage and how women are treated. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on on how to do something like that, or if it can even be done. Open question. Uh, that, that's a very frustrating uh, question because I I really believe that the uh, sadly that the feminist movement in America is totally focused on the abortion issue, and it's really tragic. Um, but I. I I, I want to make a comment, too, about the woman that was from Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, all the leaders in the Iranian human rights movement are women. and Because it's the women that were uh, subjugated to wearing the hijab. I mean, all the, all the violence against the women was started when Iranian revolution, you know, when the Khomeini came to power. Um, and they're, but it's the women that are pushing back and leading the, the democracy, the ones that are very much involved in that. Um, but I think that that's one of the problems. I think as long as the feminist movement in America is so focused on the abortion issue, it's hard to get them to get interested in these other issues. It's really a, it's really a tragedy because it is absolutely a fact that, the, that all the countries that empower women and give women rights are the ones that are prosperous. That's just a fact. And it's a shame that I don't know how, mm -hmm. to, how to change that, but that seems to be the main focus. It's very frustrating because I talk to women, and I also do work in Africa, um, and the things that a African women have to deal with are just so removed. I mean, they, they're so removed from what we, the issues that we face as women. Yeah. Right. Hi, I'm Deborah Weiss from the Center for Security Policy. Thanks so much for your panel. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, since you're talking about uh, human rights violations of women worldwide, uh, a lot of people who work on human rights think that, especially in the Muslim world or the Middle East, that it's really more properly characterized as a religious problem rather than a gender problem. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Because as long as the religion says this is how they're supposed to treat them, I don't know how you're supposed to correct that. And my second question is just for the property and the titles that you're giving these women. I just got back from South Africa, and there's massive institutionalized discrimination against whites, which is being justified by the previous apartheid against blacks, and you never hear about it. And I'm just wondering, where are they magically getting these properties, and how does that play into it? Thanks. Casey, do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, so that's a problem. Um, we have, I think it's five partners in South Africa, um, two of which are working on the current expropriation issue. Um, so we're looking at this from multiple different ways, but you know, um, this issue in particular is um, these individuals have rights to their properties, but they have never been enforced by, by the government. They've never, um, you know, all of us in the room, I'm sure, are for um, protection of property rights because that's how societies are able to flour flourish. So these people, you know, historically through their families have owned this property and they were taken away. Um, so that's kind of the context on that specific issue. But um, we do have partners working in South Africa on addressing the very um, upsetting rhetoric going around right now with with the the racism and expropriation from white landowners. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone I want could, to do that? I could speak just quickly to the, to, I think, to your first question. Um, I, I think it's difficult when you look, when you get into religious um, religious doctrine and people's different interpretations of that doctrine, you can always find a differing viewpoint. And I look at something, I just want to bring up an example um, right now that's kind of timely. There's something, female genital mutilation, that's that many of us know about. Um, and you will have many who say, well, that's absolutely a religiously sponsored you know, practice, and that's something that, you know, should be done and has to be done, um, you know, to be a good follower of that religion. And then you have as many, maybe more, people who say that's not how we interpret that religion. And so for us, sitting here in, in the United States, you know, we can come out and say that we don't find that to, that is a crime here in this country. That's not going to happen. It can't happen here. And as we stand as an example, and with, say, the UN that's declared that an abuse of human rights, all we can do, I think, now, we speak out against it. We go as strictly and strongly as we can in this country promote efforts at the UN and the global community to stand, you know, for it being considered a, a horrible practice, you know, and, and, and something that is um, a huge violation of human rights. Now, here, here again, I'd like to recommend Lee Smith's book, The Strong Horse, because the basic, his basic point is your basic point. Um, many of the things that we think of as religious are, in fact, cultural in the Middle East, and there are vast differences between um, the religion of Islam as practiced in the Middle East among Arab people and, let's say, um, Malaysians and Indonesians in Asia, which was also Elon Berman's point. People do – some things are cultural and some things are religious. I would recommend Lee's book as a really good way to start approaching that problem. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, okay, we have – One quick thing. You uh, what, are you doing, what, what are you doing in <laughs> January? Let me take – uh, Center for Security Policy, we have to empower Muslims that agree with us. The freest Muslim country where women have equal rights, the most educated Africa, people group in all of Africa is the Sahrawi Republic. And they're currently occupied by Morocco. And we should be standing up for them. And John Bolton knows this. He's been an advocate. But they are the most advanced. Uh, you're being, they have a, a constitution model after ours. I'm leading a group that I've been trying to get Frank Gaffney to go. So... <laughs> Maybe you could go. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, I, th I think those of us who sat here until 6 o'clock actually got the best panel of the day. Yep. Thank you to the <laughs> panelists. <laughs> it was a pleasure moderating both, and we are adjourned. <laughs>